about you, but there's something really, really beautiful about hearing God's people worship him, isn't there? I mean, that's just, it's like the danger, you know, the danger of having fun and enjoyable music and things is that, is that we could get caught up in listening to uh, what's coming from the stage. And that's great. But uh, the greater reality is that for a moment there, we got to hear what God hears uh, as he hears his people singing to him and worshiping him and, 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 and focusing so much attention uh, on him. Uh, thank you guys for being worshipers today. Um, I have to tell you something. I am, I don't, I don't know if the word nervous is the right word, but I am, I, I have more like pent up energy about teaching today's message than I have in years, I think. I, I, I it, it took twice as many hours this week to work on and, uh, so let me see if I can illustrate to you the tension that, that we're going to talk about today. Uh, trying to figure out, as a Christ follower, like, I love theological discussions. I love thinking about who God is and what God means to us and who we are because of who God is. One of the hardest, when it gets like really practical, one of the hardest realities is trying to understand practically the teamwork between God's sovereignty and man and woman's choices. Like figuring that out. Let me see if I can illustrate. When I find myself getting a little bit lazy in my own calling, like the things that I know the Lord has told me to do, right? When I find myself getting a little bit like overly relaxed, like a little too laid back and not quite so focused in the things God has called me to do, here's the conviction I feel from the Lord. Brad, I gave you a job to do. Get off your hind end and get it done. Right? Do you, do you, you ever heard the Lord like talk to you? Like, I don't know if he speaks country daddy to you, but to me, you know, he speaks like country man daddy. Sometimes like, get off your behind and get it done. Okay, and at the same time, whenever I get overly confident in my calling, like, man, look at the job I've done. This has been great. You know what the Lord's conviction to me is? None of it had anything to do with you. I'm sovereign. I did it all. <laughs> do you guys understand the tension between those two, like those two realities? Like trying to figure out how do I recognize and honor the sovereignty of God without letting that make me feel like I don't have a job to do? Make sense? Like, like letting that make me feel like I, what I do doesn't matter, Right? And at the same time, not coming to a place where I'm trying to make things happen that only God can make happen, or that I'm trying to take too much credit for that which only the Lord can do. That is the tension that we start with today in dealing with the teaching series, series Pivot. Um, for those of you who are Friends fans, I have tried to find a way to build the, the staircase scene with the couch, the pivot, Joe, you got to, okay, none of you watch TV. Okay. Uh, there's a funny, iconic 90s sitcom called Friends. David Schwimmer was in it, you know, like those kinds of things. Uh, anyway, I haven't been able to figure it out. You guys keep daring me to find a way to put it in. I'll try and see if I can figure it out. Uh, but uh, at the least I can do, I can say out loud, all of us together, pivot. Yeah, like I can do that. I can at least do that. Okay. So, uh, so we'll, we'll figure out what to do next. Uh, a pivot is when, you, is when you find reason to change direction. Like when something's happening and you're heading in this direction and you, and you realize I don't need to head in that direction any longer, I'm going to pivot and head in a different direction. The word is often used in sports. I'm a big basketball fan. If you're going to be a good guard who has a good handle on the ball, you're going to have to have the ability to pivot. You're going to have to have the ability. If you're going to play under the basket with your back to the basket, you're going to have to understand how to correctly use your pivot foot. Uh, you have to know how to move in those moments in order to create space for success. That's what you have to do. In any organization or leadership or church or anything like this, sometimes we have to pivot. Sometimes we have to. And a few years ago, um, a combination of the people of Woodlawn Church and uh, people of a, of, a, of a local church plant that was getting started, they decided to work together to pivot. It was really a pivot for both of them. Both groups of people are now headed in a more unique, uh, a more unified process and direction. And, and then, here's what's crazy, 
after this group of people and this group of people decided to, to team up and pivot together, a bunch of you showed up, which creates a third group of people, those who jumped into the pivot uh, after it started. And I think actually that is actually the largest of the three groups of people now is that you guys are kind of soaking in this, what God's doing in our lives and becoming a big part of it. Today marks the beginning of a four-week series called Pivot in which we're going to talk about what that looks like and continuing to move forward with that. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians almost explicitly uh, through this time, Ephesians chapter 4 specifically. Uh, we're going to be there a lot. Um, today, I'm going to try to help us build up to that. We're going to spend some time in the history of the church at Ephesus and understanding what's going on there because they have pivots that they need to be making and God is working out in them. At the same time, something else is happening simultaneously. In addition to just working through what it means to pivot uh, in a church or in your own life, but also figuring out like, what God is telling us through the book of Ephesians, uh, we're also, as a church, getting very practical in thinking about where we're headed in the future, what God wants from us in the future. And that comes all the way down to some major renovations we're going to make on the facility, some adjustments we're going to make with our staff, uh, and even some, some things that are broken that we're going to fix. Uh, some of those things. And so to raise resources for that, uh, many, most of you know this already, we are launching something called Bloom. Uh, Bloom is a fundraising campaign over the next couple of years to help pay for all of those things so that we can get not just our people, which is the primary issue, but in addition to that, our space, our holy space in the right place for us to be able to have longstanding, strong, positive gospel ministry long into the future right here on the south side of Paducah, okay? So I'm going to begin, actually, by showing you something that a couple of you have seen before. The reason I want you to see this again is to know that even though we started with this little short presentation I'm going to do almost a full year ago now, not one word on the presentation has changed. We have, we have said this is what we thought we were going to do. God has proven clearly this is what we should do. And I just want to make sure everybody in the room is up to speed on where we're headed. This is a fun time. So think with me, if you will, about what it is that God's doing with us as a church. This is kind of the path forward. We call this bloom. The scripture teaches this in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6. Uh, this is something that is very important for us. And pay attention because this guy, Apollos, he's going to come back up in today's message. What, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Uh, servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. Paul says, he's writing 1 Corinthians, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So you see that tension I mentioned earlier between the things people are doing and the things God is doing and how God is working his sovereign acts through people's choices and at the same time their obedience doesn't in and of itself make growth happen. God is the one who's bringing these kinds of growths. So we see that for our own selves to recognize, okay, at the very least I can start out the day going, there are things that God's going to call me to do and I need to do them. And at the same time, ultimate, ultimate success does not depend on me. Ultimate success depends on the Lord. So those two realities are true. See, all growth comes from God and only God can grow a church. Only God can grow a church. I, I say this to you because it's a really important factor. Uh, I have had in my life as a pastor, I've been a part of several churches that have grown. In that time, a lot of times, people want to put that success on people. Like, man, you guys have grown your church so well. Here's the problem with that. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. It's not true because whatever happened, God was growing those things. We were simply doing things like watering and planting and serving. Okay, that's what we were doing. God was growing. If you believe that kind of stuff about yourself and you go, look what we did, then you, just like God's people throughout thousands of years, find yourself taking credit, which is God's credit for yourself. And ultimately what that means is God usually takes away the growth to show you that, no, you didn't do that. I did that. Okay. See, God calls us to plant and water well, to invest in people, to care about People, when we enrich the soil, we plant the seeds. I know these are all farming metaphors, but, but I think you get it. When we do that, then God, just like he's the one who grows the lilies in the valley, God grows his people and grows his church. 
You've heard us talk about our mission statement for a while now, but, but I want to make sure you understand that this is more than just a pithy saying that we say every now and then to try to uh, sound progressive or to try to sound new or fresh. This is us articulating what we really believe God is calling us to do. Uh, so we're endeavoring you know, to like build an on-mission culture where we as a group of people are constantly on mission together. And that mission is this, revering Jesus by this, the four R's, responding to grace, that's something we do internally. In other words, that's about you trusting God for his grace in your life. You responding to his grace with faith. And you not only doing that for salvation, but you do that for daily life. Like, I'm a man or woman of, like, I'm a man. You might be a man or a woman of grace. God has changed my life because of his grace. And therefore, everything I face, every choice I make, everything that comes up against me, I recognize God's grace. Then there are two things that we actually are a part of doing. Two things that not only are we doing internally, but two things where God is using us to do it for others. And that is that we are helping revive believers and reach neighbors. Both of those are actually things God calls you to do. To help revive believers. Here's what that looks like. You know somebody, everybody in the room does, we'll talk about this more today. You know somebody who claims to be a Christ follower they have a story of conversion. They have a story of them becoming a Christ follower. Maybe at some point in their life, they were connected to a church and had a healthy relationship with a church, but now they're not. Now they're disconnected. Uh, the world uses words like de-churched or the, the kind of new one is church hurt. Uh, and, and those folks are pulled back. It's our job. We get to be used by God. He does the great work, but our planting and watering is that we are helping those people find re revival in their own spirit, in their own life. Not only that, but we're also reaching our neighbors. These are people who are not currently Christ. They're not believers. They don't know the Lord. And we have the opportunity to take the gospel to them. Ultimately, when we live as people of grace, and then we are used by God to revive believers and reach our neighbors, what happens is that God renews entire communities. This is the beauty of the gospel. It's why we talk about it. So let's get practical. We told you six months or so ago that we were going to start by changing our first impressions. And over the last six months, you guys have seen the new hallway out front. Anybody get some coffee this morning? That kind of thing? I, okay, so I, before I ask this question, I want you to know, I personally have had very little to do with that, with that work out there. That way, this is a joke. If you don't like it, it's not my fault. I know you love it. I know you love it. And that's, and that's, what, that's the reason I could even joke like that. How, just honestly, just let's take a casual moment here. How many of you have really enjoyed the first impression shift that you have seen us make? You can clap, you can shout out, you can do whatever you want to. If you've had a good time with that, are you enjoying that? I cannot believe I can't get you to clap. Like, like the, yeah, like, like, come on, there we go. Come on, there we go. Of course. And what you don't know is it's not done. It's not done. There's still a lot of cool decor things that are changing and developing uh, over the next, I don't know, I hate to say a, a time limit, but over the next few weeks, uh, definitely a few months, you're going to see additional things happen, and uh, I'll tell you more about it as it develops. But uh, that is happening throughout the space. The three to five year plan, I actually am seeing this maybe come down to more like a two to three year plan. I think it's happening faster than we expected, uh, is that we, Woodlawn Gathered, uh, are, are finding ourselves becoming better at hospitality. Um, I use the word wanted there. It's an important word. Uh, I'll put it this way. We are moving from a welcome culture to a wanted culture. Think about the difference. When you say someone is welcome, what is the difference between saying you are welcome here versus you are wanted here. Both of them are nice things. I'm not like saying, don't you dare use the word welcome. Like, that's not what I mean. But, but the word welcome simply means if you choose to show up, that would be okay with me. If you choose to be here, I'm okay with that. But see, when I say you are wanted, what that means is that if you choose not to show up, I'm going to miss you. Like you are genuine, like you are want. It's not just that there's a seat here for you if you want it, but if not, no big deal to me, no skin off my, like, no, you know, like that's, no, moving from a welcome to a wanted culture is that we actually put ourselves out there and care about people being in here, right? And so this is what's different. All of a sudden now, if you are welcoming your neighbor versus wanting your neighbor, welcoming goes, hey, 
If you show up, great. If you don't, no big deal. But when you say, I want you there, when you really feel that, all of a sudden, God is using you to, to have a stronger sense of care and concern for someone so that you actually build into your own walk with God a yearning and a desire for someone's life change and spiritual walk with the Lord to be a part of what God's doing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the slides, but just, just that's a big deal for us. We're also encouraging children and youth and students of all ages. We're going to build a children's ministry and a youth ministry here at Woodlawn Church that will positively affect the neighborhood children all around us, as well as the children who are, and teenagers who are brought here by families who do not live anywhere near our building. This is going to be a great place for people to grow up as a Christ follower, as a, as a child and as a teenager. Our worship experiences are continuing to develop. And, and people, we're going to become a people of prayer like you have never, maybe you have, like I've never experienced. Uh, focusing more and more on who it is that we are in God's image and direction. So the facility is getting some facelifts. I'll talk more about it later. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that today. Uh, and ultimately, even as we look outward, outside, beyond the space, uh, there's this desire for us to genuinely disciple people. I want to get this... I want to get this out there clearly. It is one thing to get people into a rotation of attending religious events. That's not bad, but that's not discipleship. Just attend, like, hey, I go to church every Sunday. That's great. I hope you do. That's not discipleship in and of itself. Discipleship is a step or two or three or four steps stronger than that in the sense that we are connecting people with people who help them walk with the Lord in stronger and stronger and more beautiful ways as their lives go on and move forward. That doesn't just happen on Sundays, obviously. That happens on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays and then again on Sundays and it keeps going. Ultimately, walking through this and seeing people discipled. So I'm not going to talk about it much today, but I want you to know that you're going to hear about Bloom over the next four weeks, uh, giving together, growing together what God's going to do with us as we move forward. Uh, I'll talk to you more about that later. The future. I'm 50. The future is a lot closer than it used to be for me. At 25, the future, man, I had years before that was going to show up. You guys get what I'm talking about? Some of you my age or older, the future, oh my gosh. It came, like it's here. The future is here. And, and how did that happen, right? Uh, okay, just for fun, we're going to let the younger folks in the room make fun of us for a second, okay? How many of you carried a beeper? How many of you have never seen a beeper? <laughs> yeah, not, not true. <laughs> Never carried one, I'm sure. Never seen one. I don't know about that. Okay, so that's what I'm getting at. We, we have in us, uh, one of the beautiful things about Woodlawn is we are multi-generational. I love that about the church. Uh, here's some of the things if you look out and just think about what's the future going to hold. Uh, there's some good things about the future. Lots and lots and lots of medical developments. Oh my gosh. Uh, they can now uh, use a device to have little lap laparoscopic surgeries that you get to go home afterwards that, that, you know, 40, 30, 20, 10 years ago, you were in the hospital for three or four days. Like, that's a wonderful thing. There's lots of good developing things coming from the future. I don't know what I think about this kind of thing. Uh, the, the, the future of trucks and cars and that kind of stuff. Uh, okay, so let, let's play with this one for a second. How many of you want to drive gas-powered American muscle that sounds like, like it's got a carburetor and, and a glass pack? Like that's what you want for the rest of your life. Hands up. Okay, okay. How many of you don't want to buy that much gasoline? <laughs> You're like... <laughs> Yeah, I get it. Okay, so, so I get it. I, I'm not even trying to get into the argument or discussion of what kind of vehicle is best. Uh, our family owns two hybrids and a 4x4 four four pickup that gets horrible gas mileage but is more fun to drive than either of the hybrids. Um, and so there's no telling where the future holds. The future is developing. We'll, we'll see when we get there, I guess. Uh, lots and lots of technological developments, and some of them are advancements. Some of them maybe not. So when we talk about the future, I know what happens. Some of us get pumped, like really excited about the future and development and growth and progress and those things. Some of us get very concerned, like, I don't know if this is progress or not. I'm not sure if this is good or not. Let's be cautious and careful. Now, here's what's interesting about the Christian faith. Do you know that the Christian faith, I'm sure you do know some of these things. Do you know that the Christian faith 
is a little over 2,000 years old. And before that, it gets its roots in a Jewish heritage that is thousands and thousands of years old. Depending upon how you date certain things in the scriptures, we're looking at a faith that either it itself or it in its roots has been in existence for six, seven, maybe more thousand years. For the most part, unchanged. You see, Christians have done a wonderful job of recognizing that the culture around us changes like crazy. Man, and more so in the last 100 years than ever in the history of mankind, probably. But, and at the same time, the gospel doesn't change. There's no, like, futuristic expression of the gospel that makes it better. You know? Like, there's no, there's no like, new revelation where we can now teach Jesus this way. And it just makes it so much more palatable for people. There's not any progress in the gospel. The gospel has progressed to its greatest state. What we get to do as a church is find a way to take the eternal, very ancient truths of the Bible and communicate them to people who are living in the future. So the world around them is adjusting. The things they're hearing is adjusting. The things they've been taught uh, outside the church are adjusting. But we get a chance to be one of the many churches who will faithfully ride into the future with an ancient faith, helping people know and understand and feel and realize, you know, like, and know God. I love that there's a moment similar to this in the New Testament where Jesus talks to his disciples just before his ascension, and he gives them a thought about their future. And I think this thought applies to our future as well. In Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20, known as the Great Commission, the scripture says this, Jesus talking to his disciples about the future. He says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Do you guys know that has not changed? That has not changed. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Christ. That has not changed. So I, I hope you really think about this. Like how much does that speak to our nervousness about the world? How much does that speak to our fear or trepidation related to what's happening in the Middle East? How much does that speak to our concern about America's next presidential campaign? How much does that speak to us about what we might think about constitutionalism or laws or taxes or the amount of groceries cost because of inflation? Like the fact that Jesus just said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I don't know, that's worthy of our joy. If you trust Jesus, he goes on to say, uh, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He's not going anywhere. He's not, all authority is his. And he's not going anywhere. He's right here with us. If we are believers. That passage is called the Great Commission. Uh, just a nice way of saying this is your mission. If you choose to accept it, so to speak. This is your mission. I want you to do it. So let's get practical. And then we're going to open our Bibles up and really dive into Ephesians. Um, someone introduced to me this idea uh, called the one. And it's really just a way to make yourself think about something that maybe you don't want to think about. And that is... In my life, has God placed someone that is either disconnected from the church, a believer who's disconnected from the church, or someone who's not a believer at all, is there someone that God is calling me to reach out to? Let me take a step back. In the 1980s in America, something that we thought was extremely good happened that I'm afraid actually was not that good. And that was this. Christians began to be taught that instead of telling someone, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus, you need to follow Jesus, you need to love Jesus, the shift became, you need to invite people to church. 
And if you'll invite people to church, then your pastor can tell people about Jesus. That's the shift that happens. I'm not saying there's something wrong with inviting people to church, but here's what it did over about a 50-year time period. Over a 50-year time period, it, it helped our, the Christians in America, begin to think, my job is to maybe, if I'm really committed, maybe invite somebody to church. When the scripture guides us that our job is to tell people about Jesus. See the difference? It's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot easier, isn't it, to go, Hey, we don't know each other that well, but hey, I have a church service. It starts at 9.30. Here's the address. Here's the website. Here's the phone number. I hope you come and walk away and go, I was just an evangelist. I just did evangelist like I just did the Great Commission. I just did that. Now, again, I hope you're doing that. I'm not discouraging you from doing what I just described. I hope that's a good thing. I'm not suggesting you don't do that, but I am suggesting that for each of us, that's not where it ends. Because what really needs to happen is that if you know this person and you have a relationship with this person and there's a level of trust that this person has for you, that I'll, those are all things, by the way, they don't have for me. They don't know me. They don't have any reason to trust me. They don't have any reason to like, have a relationship. You get to be the person to talk to them about Jesus. They might be your one. Now, I, I'm not up here telling you that God only gives you one or anything like don't, don't, this is not magic, it's not any of that. It's just a way for us to think about who am I supposed to positively influence with the gospel? Who is someone I'm supposed to be burdened over? Who is someone I'm supposed to lose a little sleep over maybe? Like who is someone that I am gonna pray for every day? Who is somebody I'm gonna be concerned about? Well, that would be uh, your one uh, let's look back at that mission statement we mentioned earlier. Those two R's in the middle that, we, that, we, that we're uh, responding to grace, but, but we're reviving believers and reaching neighbors. Those are the two people that I'm talking about here that might be somebody. You might think, that's, that's my one. That's my one. I have, I have somebody in my life that I love, and they don't know Jesus. Well, my prayer today is that the Lord would burden you for them, that the Lord would, bird, that the Lord would give you their name, and that relationship, and that you would actually think about it a lot, that you would be concerned for them often, and that he would motivate you to a place where you actually take steps. Now, remember, this is all still about his sovereignty. He's sovereign. He's going to handle their salvation. If they come to know Christ, it will be because of Christ, not you, but he's calling you to get involved and act. And so those are the steps that we take. How can I water and plant so that God can cause the increase, so to speak. That would be your one. Your one. For the next month, I am going to bug you to death about, do you know who your one might be? Have you thought about that? I'm never going to ask you to tell me their name. I'm not asking you to do any of that. I, I am going to say, have you thought about somebody? I personally, as your pastor, believe that God wants me to want you to experience some burden over this to really think about, man, this is a person who God can use me to help. God can use me to help this person. Well, let's do this. If you would, if you've got your Bibles on you, a Bible app on your phone, whatever, open up to Ephesians, uh, several books into the New Testament. Uh, as you're turning there, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. And uh, I can't wait to study the book of Ephesians with you over the next four weeks. Um, let's do this. I think I've told you this before, but the church in Ephesus in the New Testament is my favorite church. I don't know if you're supposed to have favorite churches or not, but I love it. I love the whole story, the narrative. I think it should be a movie or a mini series. It's like this is some really rich narrative and storytelling going on from the beginning of Ephesus. We actually in the New Testament, we see it from the beginning to its end. We see all of it right in the New Testament, or at least a warning toward its end. In Acts chapter 18, we see three people pop up. Uh, in the storyline. There's a man named Apollos. Apollos is, uh, is a Christ follower. He is someone who is very new to the faith, but he's very passionate about it. Now, Apollos is not a great theologian, not at this point in the story. He doesn't fully understand a lot of things about grace. All he knows is repent, believe, be baptized, follow Jesus. That's what you need to do. And he goes into the city of Ephesus, and he's telling those people about that. Some of them respond. 
Some of them respond. There's two more people. They were traveling with Paul. It's a married couple, Aquila and Priscilla, or Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, and, and here's what happens. Kind of an interesting story. Um, they meet up with this new group of Christians that are in Ephesus, and they realize that Apollos has done a really good job of teaching them part of the gospel. And so they then step in, and they support Apollos, and they encourage Apollos, and they help him. And together, they teach the Christians at Ephesus a really good way of understanding what Jesus is doing in their lives. And there develops in them this growing, exciting church. Now, there are lots of things going on in Ephesus. Ephesus is a big city. Uh, Ephesus has a temple to a, 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 a goddess of intimacy. Like there's lots of weirdness going on there. Lots of things happening in Ephesus. It's a place where a lot of uh, uh, commerce was coming through. Lots of money in Ephesus. It's a growing, developing Roman Empire city. It's such an important part of the early church's development that the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote about a third or a little more of the New Testament, he shows up and gives three years of his life to that city and to those Christians. He, this, is after, this is after his time with, uh, with Priscilla, Aquila, and Apollos. So now we're in Acts chapter 19, and then we, we hear some more even after that uh, of Paul leading and teaching for three years uh, in this church. I think it's interesting. So now, using our language, the pastors of the church in Ephesus have been Apollos, Priscilla, and Aquila, and Paul. Like that, that's, that's a pretty good lineup right there of early church leaders that have been there. So then Paul, after three years, realizes he needs to get back on the mission field. He needs to go to other cities. And so he leaves, but he leaves this young man named Timothy there. And, and as Timothy is kind of a primary leader in the church at Ephesus, this is where we get the books of First and Second Timothy. And if you've read First and Second Timothy, you know that Timothy had a hard time because to put it, how do I put it in Kentucky ways of thinking? Uh, Timothy was the Mark Pope of the church of Ephesus. Here's what I mean. For those of you who are not basketball fans, uh, there's a new basketball coach in Kentucky. His name's Mark Pope. The, the, the fellow who was before him, John Calipari, was fairly popular. A lot of people know his name. Uh, but he left, and now a guy who not so many people know his name is in that job. Okay, so what you get is a whole bunch of people going, I don't know if he can do this job or not. I'm not sure if he's going to be as good as the last guy. But you also have a few people who are like, I could not stand the last guy. This guy's going to be great, right? So you get all that tension. So what I'm getting at is Timothy, young leader, walks into a very important role, and everybody has an opinion. Everybody has an opinion about what's going to happen, how he's going to do, okay? So Paul, being a good mentor, doesn't just drop him in the job and walk away to Arkansas. He doesn't do that. That's supposed to be funny. Just laugh. It's okay. God, just, just, he doesn't do that. Paul actually stays in contact with Timothy, encouraging him, helping him, supporting him, writing letters to him that we then, uh, that we then get to read as part of the New Testament. Some of my favorite of all the New Testament letters are Paul's letters to Timothy. I just Love it. I loved it when I was the young leader, thinking how awesome would it be to have somebody like Paul in my life? And now I read them thinking, oh my gosh, I need to be better to the young leaders because they need somebody who's gone ahead of them to support, encourage, and help them. All right, even after that time, Paul then writes a letter to the church at Ephesus after Timothy's time there. This is the book that we'll be teaching out of today. And in that book, he's talking to them about a pivot, a change, a shift that they need to consider making in some of the way that they walk with and find Christ in their church. There's more, though, in the church at Ephesus. Long after the book of Ephesians, then we find that the next leader in the church of Ephesus is none other than the beloved disciple John, who lives in Ephesus and from Ephesus writes 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and ultimately ends up writing the book of Revelation while most likely on the, on the Isle of Patmos. And in the book of Revelation, there's a letter to the church in Ephesus. So all of that New Testament stuff is about this one church and their interaction with God and all different kinds of things, okay? Does anybody remember, by the way, what is told in the Revelation letter to the church at Ephesus? He says this to them. I'm not going to read it, but just in, he says, I'm proud of how hard you've worked. I'm proud of how hard you fought. 
There were some battles they had. That's what you read in the book of Ephesians. You see a little bit of that in First and Second Timothy. Um, you did well. He said, this is what I bring against you. Some of you know where I'm going with this. In the process of all that being strong and being tough and standing up and, and doing all that good thing, he says, you lost your, anybody? Your first love. In other words, you let the battle callous you to the point that your softness and your love for God isn't what it once was because you've seen it go through this time of battle, right? That's ultimately the church in Ephesus. So now that I've given you that big picture kind of visual of what we're talking about, let's jump right in. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Again, if you've got your paper Bible, awesome. If not, if you're using a, a Bible, it'll be on the screen, but I, I want to make sure we connect with the Bible in our hands because the screen doesn't go home with you, you know, <laughs> and this one does. So make sense? Okay, so Paul is writing, and here's what he says. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me, for you. I could spend an hour on that verse. I'm just going to deal with the last four words right now. To me, for you. I told you earlier that there's this weird tension in the Bible between the sovereignty of God doing amazing and beautiful things and then at the same time God calling his people to do wonderful and amazing things and that we cannot find ourselves being too lazy or too uncommitted in order to do the things God's called us just because we know he's sovereign. And at the same time, we cannot bring ourselves to a place of personal success, looking at ourselves like great leaders in God's kingdom when ultimately he's the one doing all the heavy lifting, okay? So we can't, somewhere in the midst of that, there is this truth though. God is sovereign and you as a believer are called. God is sovereign and you are called. And specifically, I love this, he says to Paul and through Paul to us, Paul says he has been given grace to him for us, or to use his exact words, to me, for you. I want you to understand something. There are many great things in your life that God has given to you for somebody else. Let that sink in for a second. There are many wonderful things in your life that God has given to you for someone else. This is a big deal. And here's what we don't need to do. We don't need to like find some sort of unhealthy or, or, or mis, misguided guilt in this. I'm not saying you should be ashamed for anything you have that you haven't given away. That's not what I'm saying. No, I'm saying at all. I am saying that, that God puts things in my hands and in your hands that give us the chance to be a beautiful support, help, and love for somebody else. He gives it to us often for them. Let's play with this. Why is it that you can sing so well? Why is it that your voice is beautiful. Is it so that you can be on a stage and people can tell you how beautiful your voice is? Is it for you? Is it for you? Is it so that you can go, look what I can do? And other people can go, look what you can do. Is that, is that, is that what it's for? American culture would help us think that's what it's for. We use phrases like American Idol and different things. Who's got it? You know, you got that thing. And, like, like, and so all of a sudden we, we make like stars out of people who have this gift. And oftentimes they take it in. Like, man, this is for me. But in the Christian context, I would say, why is it that you got that great gift? Is that God has given it to you for someone else. Your voice can draw people to Christ. Your voice can get someone's attention. Your voice has the opportunity to be a blessing and benefit to somebody else. As a worshiper, there's nothing better if you can't sing than somebody who can. Because you just be real quiet, you just make a joyful noise quietly and you enjoy them making a joyful noise beautifully, right? 
You're like, oh, this song is great. As long as I'm not the lead singer, this song is great. You know, um, this could be true. I just, use, I just use vocals for one thing. Like, this could be true of fa- financial resources. This could be true of your ability to help someone medically. This could be true of your ability to help, to, like, have financial wisdom. This could be your ability to, like, just be great at parenting. Or, or maybe you just got a fantastic understanding of marriage. Like, those kinds of things. Guess what? God has given you this. He gave it to you. But oftentimes, he gave it to you for them. And this is a blast. If you've never done it, and I'm sure you have, but let me just encourage you to consider this. When God has given you something, whether it's like a, a, you know, a house or a car or if it's a talent or something you possess, but then you get to be a part of using that thing to bless someone else, and then you get to stand back and watch their life benefited by what you have and what you used, There is no greater joy. There is no greater joy than being in this to me for them, to me for you reality. It's why, let's let's get this. You guys know in the eight different uh, things that we use as a church to kind of describe uh, who we are. One of them is the bag chair. And the bag chair symbolizes that we're all supposed to bring our own chair. Let's just carry your own chair. In other words, be responsible for yourself. This is why. This is why this is important. Because if I spend my life just letting everybody else be responsible for me. One of the things is that ultimately they will lose the joy helping me because they know they're just empowering me not to be the most healthy self I can be. But the flip side of that is true. I never get to experience the joy of God giving me something for them. And I miss out on the fact that that I got to be a support and a help to somebody else through something God gave me. It's one of the reasons we, we want people to understand the importance of, of, of packing their own chair, like being responsible for themselves, because in the process of doing that, God will use you in a way that will bring a kind of joy to your life that you might not have experienced before. We want you to have that joy. Let's keep going. Um, if you read the Bible much, or if you get into studying it, one of the things that's going to kind of come at you is you're going to hear that people have kind of rumored in the past that, that Paul and this other Bible writer, James, that they in some way disagree about good works and faith. So in order for me to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian who does good works in the right way, with the right motivation, with the right attitude, understanding the sovereignty of God and calling you to behave and perform and do things, you need to really battle with this little issue that some people think James and Paul disagreed about. Let's look at it. In the book of James, uh, second chapter, James says this, uh, what good is it, brothers, if someone says they have faith, but they do not have works, action. In other words, in other words their, their, their Christianity is just words, just words. Like they, they say they have faith, but there's no good works. There's no action. And, and he says, can that faith save him? Is that the kind of faith that is the kind of faith the New Testament talks about when the New Testament talks about the fact that someone's saved through faith? Like, is that, is that it? That, that's what he's talking about. So we need to make sure we're defining the word right, James says. Uh, he goes on to say this. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for their body, what good is that? It's like, if you're, if you're, if you're just words, what good is that? It doesn't help. He ends this by saying the thing that that is so controversial. He says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Okay, so let's, he just said, so faith, if it doesn't have good works by itself, it's dead. Well, I have to admit on first glance, I do kind of think, you know, it sounds a little bit like, I don't know if Paul would have said it exactly that way, but but wait a second, let's see what he's actually saying. He's actually saying here that, Real faith, like genuine faith, theologians would call it salvific faith. That's a big word for you. The, 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 the real faith results in good works. That's, that's, what's, that's what he's saying. He's saying you can measure someone's faith by the, by the way their life is lived. You can. 
Let me illustrate it backwards. As a senior pastor for 30 years, I, I can tell you several times that someone came to me and said, Uncle Joe has died, and I want you to do Uncle Joe's funeral. Now, I don't know Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe didn't come to church with me, and I'm just making up a name here so that you know, okay? And here's what will happen. A family who really loves the Lord, here's what will happen, is they will scour through Uncle Joe's mama's Bible, trying to find a record that maybe at some point Uncle Joe got baptized. Like, to, to like scour, trying to find some hint of hope that Uncle Joe's faith was real. What James is saying is that we'll know your faith is real by the way you live your life. We don't have to find a notation in Grandma's Bible to know that your faith was real. The real faith results in some sort of ethical, moral, genuine, physical response. That's all that James is saying. Let's look now and see what Paul says. Paul says in Ephesians, where we're studying, Ephesians chapter 2 here, Paul says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. Okay, wait, Paul introduces a new word. But James didn't use the word grace at all, not, not, and not in that passage. Now, Paul says it's, it's by grace through faith. And then he says, this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of works. So that no one may boast. This one's kind of weirded me out. When someone makes a profession of faith and other people go, I'm so proud of you. I catch myself going, no, 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 no. We're so proud of God. Like we're so, th we're so thankful to the Lord. The Lord is the one who did this. Like let's just make sure we get that clear. I'm not saying we should not say those words, but I just want to make sure we get it right in our head. But here's, here's what he's saying. He's saying that works do not cause faith. Good works do not produce real faith. That's, that's what he's saying. You remember what, what James said. Let's go back here. James says real faith produces works. And then Paul says works do not produce faith. In fact, this is what he's saying. He is saying that we are saved by grace. It is the grace of God. It is the absolute goodness of a holy God who hung his own son on a cross to die for the sins of his people so that he would then offer and give that grace from heaven to you and I. And that grace interacts with us and then our response to grace is faith. It's saved by grace through faith, which produces works. <laughs> Saved by the grace of God, through faith, that's our, our reaction, which produces works. Paul and James are not disagreeing. Paul and James are talking to two different groups of people about the same topic. Paul is talking to new believers, helping them understand what it means to be saved by the grace of God, which brings about faith in our life, which then produces good works in our life. Uh, James is talking to folks who want to claim to be Christians, but their life shows no evidence of it. And he's saying, wait a second, let's dial it back here and let's look at what real faith is. I'm telling you that because when I ask you to do things, when I, like, when I tell you God has called you to do this, I want to make sure that you don't hear me saying, this is what I need to do in order to impress God. This is what I need to do in order to prove my faith. This is what I need to do in order to gain some greater standing in heaven. And I am not telling you any of those things. What I am telling you is that out of a heart of faith that has been cleansed and remade by the grace of God, I got no choice but to obey him because he is the one who saved me. And that is what I would shove onto those I'm teaching, that we honor God and obey him and respond to his calling in our life, not because we better, but because he's already done so many things in us that there is no other response. There is no other response. Ephesians 2 says, for we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works. Paul doesn't disagree with James at all. We are created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Get this. I, I want to make sure you get this, okay? When God, in his infinite memory, past, present, future, when God prepared for your salvation, it wasn't just to get you to heaven, but it was to help you not only be blessed by your relationship with him, it was to help you be a blessing to other people. God preordained and designed that he would not only save you by his grace, that not only would you then respond in faith, but that there are good works in your life, things he's going to use you to accomplish and do that he set a long time ago. Your opportunity is to simply say, yeah, I'm here, I'm in, I'm willing. And this is for us to do. Scripture goes on to say in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, this is my primary text for the day, and I know you're thinking, you're just getting started? No, I promise. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time. But Paul once again says something. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. Do you see now why we had to do all this background? Because God just told you and I that we need to walk in a worthy manner of our calling. And I don't want us to misunderstand what he's saying. He's not saying get it right or you're out. He's not saying you better perform or I will not be impressed. He is saying I have created you with a purpose for beautiful living. I have created you for a peace and a joy and a fruitfulness that I set in motion before you were ever born. And I want you to experience it. So go be the person I've created you to become. He goes on to say, with all, he kind of describes what it's like to walk in that calling. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Very quickly, I'm just going to walk you through some words, and we'll be done with the message. Paul describes himself as a prisoner of Christ. Well, this is very interesting because Paul was a prisoner of Rome. Paul's in jail writing this, okay? I want to go, who's all been in jail? No, I won't do that. There might be more hands than you think, you know? So, so Paul's in jail. Paul is writing from the, the literal place of being a prisoner of Rome. I love that Paul does not describe himself as a prisoner of Rome. Paul describes himself as a prisoner of Christ. Here's what we gain from this. Get this. Everybody thinks if God's going to use me, God's going to use me in the way I want God to use me. And that's not always true. I might go beyond not always and say rarely ever true. <laughs> See, I'm sure that Paul would have loved to have said, I'm writing this to you from the largest church with the biggest pulpit in all of Ephesus. That's not. He's like, I'm writing this to you from a small jail cell that smells like bad things. And he doesn't say, these dang Romans have got me in chains. He says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. Paul owns it. Get this. You ever been around somebody who's suffering and you go to them and go, dude, I wish I could remove your suffering and their response, not to be like overly pious or try to pretend to be holy, but their honest response is, no, I don't want to take it away. God's doing something in this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking for him to take away the pain. God is, God is doing, I, I'm, I'm his right now. I know this, I've, I've talked to people who were battling a disease or going through painful things, who in their response to me, their pastor, I'm just trying to make it feel better, right? I'm just trying to help. Their response to me is, the Lord is so close to me right now. I am so close to him. And although I would have never chosen this pain, I don't want to hurt, we're not masochists, that's not what we're saying, but man, the closeness that I felt with God in the midst of the pain reminds me that I am his. 
Sometimes that's how God uses you. That's how God's using Paul, the one who wrote the book that we're reading and studying. So if he'll do that to Paul, he will do that to you, right? Paul says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. He then calls us to walk worthy. Some of you are like, maybe it doesn't really mean that in the Greek. I just checked it. You know what it means? It means walk worthy. Translators did a darn good job. To walk worthy. That's what you got to do. In other words, it means correctly handle it. Like, it mean, like, like to actually, uh, I know this is a word we don't want to use, but like to, to perform correctly. Like do it right. That's what he's saying. I want you to walk worthy of your calling to which you have been called. Okay, so if we only hear that from kind of a Western world performance mindset, here's what we'll hear. We will hear a drill sergeant looking at us saying, why aren't you doing it as good as everybody else? Everybody else gets it right, you get it wrong, what's your problem? Okay, that is not what Paul's saying. That's not the attitude, the perspective. Not only that, that's not how anybody would have heard it who read this the first time. It's different. You see, he just told them that they had a worthiness that's been given to them. He just told them that they had a value that's been gifted to them. He's only telling them to let that which is inside of them out. Let that greatness that God has placed in you by his stripes, you've been healed. Let let that thing that's in you that God put there, let it out. Walk worthy of your calling. God has done something beautiful in you. He has planned something amazing in you. Be it. That's what he's saying. Walk worthy of your calling. Calling in and of itself is an interesting word. It's kaleo. It's one of my favorite Greek words. To be called. To be sometimes used to be sent. Um, Listen. God does not need us on his team to accomplish God-sized things. And yet, he invites us on his team to accomplish God-sized things. He calls us. I don't know if this is true for you, but when I was a little kid, I was a little bit ADHD. I was a lot. I'm even more so as an adult, but let me just take you back then. When I had a friend coming over, my parents could tell you this is true, and it's like 15 minutes till they're supposed to get here. I sat in the front room looking out the window. Like, man, when are they going to go by here? They're almost here. When are they going to get here? Now, we didn't have Live 360. I can be like, how far out are they? Oh, nine minutes. No, like, no, they're driving 63 miles an hour. No, I, can't, I couldn't do that. You can now. I couldn't then. I just had to sit there and wait. There was this sense of anticipation. Like, I cannot wait till they get here. I can't, this is going to be so much fun. This is going to be so exciting. I can't wait. Somewhere along the line, here's what the enemy does to so many people. The enemy makes this sense of calling feel like the Lord is just going to demand some horrible sacrifice from you that you don't want to make, but he's going to make you do it. We, we, used, to, we used to joke about, well, I hate to, I hate to tell the Lord I'll do anything because he might send me to somewhere. He might send me somewhere. I don't want to go, right? It's not how it works. When God calls you to something, part of what he does in your life is give you passion for that something. He also gives you skill sets and gifting to be able to do something with that something. So when I respond to God's calling, there gets to be an anticipation on my side, for how amazing it's going to be to connect arms with the Lord and be a part of what he's doing that only he can do, but he wants me on board. And he wants you on board. Don't be afraid of calling. Run to it. Look out the window with anticipation. I can't wait till the Lord reveals to me my calling. Recognize that, it, that it's about purpose and value. So many Christians live in life just turning the wheel to get from Monday to Friday and Monday to Friday to pay the bills and eat something nice and watch their favorite rerun on Friday nights living without purpose. Living without calling. Kaleo. The Lord has given me a job to do that is a part of his God-sized plan. 
And he wants me or you to be in on it. And when he gives us that, he gives it to us for them. Right? To us for them. This is so good. He describes what that looks like. And the first thing he describes is like this love, this togetherness in love. And I'm going to put this together with unity in the spirit. These kind of work together. Um, This is a big part of what took me so long this week. Really, really, really wanting to make sure that I understand. Get this. Um, We as human beings, we do a lot of things to try to create unity. We do a lot of things to try to create clarity. Uh, So like... As, as your leader, I'll give you, like, I think it's my job to clearly articulate the mission and direction of the church, make sure I lead with transparency, talk about stuff more, more than I want to, because you need to hear it often enough that you know we're real deal and we're headed in the right direction and we're, we're making good choices. You, we, transparency with fundraising and with spending and all that stuff, like all kinds of accountability. Like as a leader, I think that's my, my job. I'm supposed to do that. And that helps us have unity. And that's true, but get this. All I'm doing is preventing major roadblocks to unity. I'm not the one that creates unity. The Holy Spirit creates unity. Here's how this works. When he says unity of the Spirit, and by the way, it's connected to the words right before it, together in love. Unity of the Spirit, together in love. In fact, I'll go back and show you in the text itself. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in in love, okay, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Okay, so when I talk about good leadership practices, I'm talking about maintenance, like maintaining unity, like just, just trying to help nothing happens that gets in the way of unity. But the unity itself is this unity of the Spirit. This unity itself is this, this, this thing that, that human beings can't do. Here's what happens. Get this. You are going to love someone that yesterday you didn't care about. You didn't have a reason to care about them. Maybe you've never met them. You're going to love someone who's in a different generation than you, different skin color than you, different heritage than you, lives with a different amount of money than you, has a completely different kind of job than you, and here's why. Because when you and I meet Christ, when, 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 when his grace... Uh, pragmatically, practically on our side is poured out to us and we respond in faith, we become a Christ follower, Uh, the the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit fills us. Fills us. I'm a new creation. You're a new creation filled with the Holy Spirit. But, But here's what's crazy. Is that when I'm in a room with other Christians, those other Christians also are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in them and in me. And now listen, personality-wise, like, is my personality going to connect with your personality? Maybe, maybe not. Like, like, maybe I'm a hunter and maybe you love PETA. Like, you know, like, okay, so maybe we're not, like, maybe we're not going to gel if we talk politics or if we, if we, you know, if we talk about, maybe, maybe, maybe you read the NIV and I like a good translation. Like, that's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be funny. Okay, just trying to be funny. So, like... The, like, like we might have differences of opinions, okay? So, but there's this unity that comes, there's this unity that comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit in you and in me that is beyond explanation. It's not just that, man, that guy's easy to get to know and he's fun to be around and she's so nice. And it's more than that. It's, it's this unity that's this, and, and in fact, The the text, as you see there, describes it as a bond of peace. A bond of peace. This is our goal. That we would be people who are responding to the call of God in our individual lives. Who are then paired up together with other spirit-filled people who are responding to the call of God in their lives. And now my joy and your joy are driven by the same spirit. 
And now my direction and your direction are driven by the same spirit. And together, it's more than just do we agree about theology or do we agree about this understanding of this reality or do we have the same opinions about all this? That's not really unity. That's just agreement. Unity is deeper than that. Unity allows for people to be unified even when they don't disagree or when they don't agree about certain things because this unity comes from something deeper than an opinion. This unity comes from the Holy Spirit. I want to be unified in a bond of love or a bond of peace with the people of Woodlawn Church, and I think you want that as well. I think that's the most beautiful thing about what God's doing here is that that's happening, right? Let's do this. Uh, I'm going to take a moment and pray for us. Uh, Mike, would you join me on stage? And we're going to take a time of prayer together as a church uh, that Mike's going to lead us through. Jesus, we trust you. We ask that you would guide and direct us. As, as Mike leads us in this, in this responsive reading time, this moment of prayer, I pray that you would help it um, become real, not just words that we say, as James described, but, but as a reality from within who we are, uh, that you would build in us this unity and this bond of peace through the Spirit. We trust you, Jesus. Amen. Stand back here so I can use it. You want this so you can control the slides? Advance. Just the advance. See, watch this. Boom, boom, boom. Right there. If you want, Jackson can control it for you. That's fine, too. Yeah, uh, Jackson, would you advance the slides for me, please? In response to our calling to be people of grace, this is a responding to grace portion of our mission statement. Ephesians 2, 4, to th 4 through 10. But God... Being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of the grace and the kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a, not a result of your work, so that no one may boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Church, our Christian life is not truly livable without our recognition from our perspective of God's grace to us and for us. God has poured out his grace on the people his church in such a way that our sins have been forgiven. Christ's holiness and righteousness have been imputed to us. When the Father looks at a true believer, he sees the goodness of Christ in the same way that on the cross, when God looked at Christ, he saw the sins of his people. Christ has paid the way for our salvation. Christ has made the way for our life. Christ has given us peace with a Father that can't be interrupted or broken by any other power or authority. We are a people of grace, and we choose to live in it. On the screen, there's a prayer if you would pray this with me. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the work Christ did for me. Thank you for the hope you've gave and given me. Lord, help me remember grace. My, my worst when I'm facing shame and struggle due to my own fault and sin, Lord, remind me of your grace. When I need to run to you for a fresh experience of peace, remind me of your grace. Lord, also, help me remember your grace when I'm at my best, when I have succeeded, when I've won, when I've been victorious. Lord, remind me of your grace. Keep me humble and peaceful. Keep me confident in you as you work in me. Keep me mindful of your grasp on my life, especially when I need it most. If now we take a moment of silent prayer and meditation to reflect on what the Holy Spirit may be speaking to you.
our calling to the de-churched or churched hurt in the community of believers around us. This is the reviving believers part of our mission statement. In Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Believers, each of us are called to bear one another's burdens. It's possible that you work with someone who's a believer but's disconnected from God's people. Maybe you have a neighbor, a friend, or a family member who just needs a little hope-filled encouragement to reconnect with the church. These are more than just mere friendships or working relationships. These are opportunities to find purpose in God's calling on your life. Would you join me in this next prayer? Dear God, help me recognize the struggle and difficulty being faced by those around me. When someone who is a believer has found themselves disconnected from your church, Lord, help me light the way for them to reconnect. Make me an instrument of your peace in their life. For many of them, reconnecting with the church can feel risky or scary. Lord, use me as a support for them. Help them navigate those steps. Use us as a church, Lord, to revive believers around us. Help me find my one. Do you take a minute to meditate on that and think about who God may be laying on your heart as your one? baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Believers, each of us are called by God as followers of Christ to those who have received his grace that we should care about our lost neighbors, friends, co-workers, and family members. Today, we ask God to burden us with a passion the salvation of at least one person in our region. We ask God to help us see with eyes of compassion, love, with a desire to share and speak words of conviction and love. And if you would pray this one final prayer for with me. Dear God, please let me see into the life of another in such a way that I might be an instrument of yours to share the gospel with them. I desire to be used by you to benefit someone who has never experienced your grace and forgiveness. Help me take notice and see. Give me passion for them. Give me concern for them. Lord, help me care deeply for them. Guide me to opportunities where I may be both an example and a voice of your grace in their life. Help me find my one. Take another just moment of prominence silent prayer and meditation to think about who your one is. As we sing this moment in time of worship, um, as always, there are lots of ways for you to respond. Uh, if you need prayer, just in a more of a private setting, then uh, I and, and at least one other leader will be in the rooms in the very back of the worship space. You can gather there and we'll pray with you privately. If you'd like to kneel before the Lord and, and pray in some sort of special way, but, but don't need support or help to do that, then feel free to come forward if you'd like to do that and kneel right here. People do that uh, very often. As always, there's nothing magical about being back there or being up here. You can talk to the Lord right where you stand. So feel free to respond to him right there. 
As a whole, we're going to sing this song. We have two songs will be done for the day. Uh, I appreciate your patience today. I know we've taken a little more time than normal, but this is a special reality of what God's doing, and we want to give it that attention. So let's respond to him in worship. <laughs>